Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me there in the back? Well, can't, hear you at all. <laughs> can't hear. Can Can you hear me? I can't hear you. You can. Good. Okay. So, um, I'm going to take the role of the grumpy old man this morning. Um, but before I really dive in, um, I want to uh, restate the purpose why we're here. The long-term goal uh, is to develop artificial general intelligence. And uh, you'll see why I want to reiterate this point, perhaps at the end. Um, now, it turns out that machines today are a lot less smarter than Hollywood wants us to believe. Of course, everyone here knows this. And certainly, they're also a lot less smart than uh, journalists want us to believe. But also, in fact, um, we as AI researchers uh, oftentimes read more into our results than we really should. Now, what are these systems that we want to build? They should be able to learn to perform um, a host of unanticipated, vastly different tasks, adapt to new circumstances, and uh, actively acquire new knowledge as needed for this. And let me just uh, emphasize here, unanticipated, not known at design time, vastly different, so a range of things, not just one thing, in new circumstances, the environment changes all the time. And they should be able to acquire new knowledge on their own. That's a lot of requirements. But I have to restate this because, in fact, um, this defines our task. So at the risk of not sounding dead serious, which I am, I'm going to tell you a short story. In a village far away, a group of scientists get together to study the flight of birds. And they want to build flying machines. They agree that they must have a formal definition of flying. But uh, they have a hard time agreeing on uh, a definition. Now, they call their field flyonics. It sounds really cool. <laughs> they struggle to find a good definition of flight because, after all, what's, uh, what's a science without a proper definition or set of definitions? Not to mention scientific fields. How can you base a field on something where you can't even define your subject? So they finally come to some conclusion by, by default, I guess, flying is lifting oneself off the ground for prolonged periods. This has the benefit that you can actually measure a lot of these things. For example, we have phi, uh, the, the, the time in air, which is the, you know, the time of, of, uh, of uh, uh, liftoff uh, minus the, the time of landing, um, and the uh, the force a cell needs to, to lift themselves off the ground and, and, and the distance to the ground. So it'll do for now, they say. We'll come back to it later. We'll figure it out, you know, better definition. So they start to work um, on some good ideas for how to address lifting oneself off the ground. And uh, they do a lot of research on this. And uh, they come up with this idea. And they say, now, jumping, that's how, what you do without these shoes. But actually, when you have these shoes on, you're flying. OK, so that's, that's the definition of, that's really what we call flying. You know, it's a new definition. OK. But as soon as people, by and large, have these shoes, everyone, of course, still calls it jumping. 
So the scientists are annoyed uh, and realize they must go on and continue working on better ways of lifting oneself off the ground and staying in the air a bit longer. But um, as they improve their results, still people call it jumping. And uh, they call it the jumping effect, well, because somehow, uh, or the flyonics effect, because somehow people just continue calling it jumping when everyone can see that we're just you know, getting closer and closer to flying. And then time passes, and young people come in, into the field, and, and the old ones uh, retire. And uh, nobody really remembers that they were going to come back to this uh, issue with the definitions and the, the formalization. And researchers for, focus on their favorite tools. And then uh, the field becomes defined by its past because you know, whatever anyone did in flyonics in the past, that's what flyonics is about. And uh, we'll just continue working on the jumping shoes and related ideas. So the moral of this story is that the urge to formalize may lead to premature definitions, um, which will lead to incorrect working assumptions, providing an improper foundation for the phenomena in question. And um, as time passes, if it's uh, long enough uh, and uh, people get used to the state of affairs, they, um, they'll just uh, not consider it an issue anymore. And I ventured that the Turing model is a very good example of such a premature definition, or at least the effects of it. Maybe historically it made sense at the time and it was a natural step, but this has become essentially uh, the cornerstone of computer science and computer science being the, the framework within uh, uh, which AI exists. And the main problem here, in my opinion, is that uh, time and energy have completely been left out of the equation, but these are both critical uh, to, in fact, the uh, emergence of intelligence as a phenomenon in nature, and uh, they define its very nature. So this incorrect application of divide and conquer in the phenomenon of, uh, on the phenomenon of AI, it leaves out time and energy. We've sliced up the problem incorrectly. We have the wrong foundation. And, uh, um, we don't think uh, enough about the operation of systems and uh, complex uh, interactions. We focus on small pieces. This is probably not news to anyone here. And this has caused a serious delay in progress towards AGI to the point where we have to have a, a special conference on AGI. Um, so in closing, what must be done? We need a better foundation for the design and implementation of energy constrained and temporally dependent systems. That's all systems, by the way. There is no such thing as a system that has all the time in the world or, or even beyond the world um, or, or all the energy in the world. We need formal theories of systems. We need better tools to deal with external real world constraints like time and energy. And letting your tools decide the research questions and topics. Bad idea. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris, for this interesting talk. And, and now we open for any questions for this talk. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I, how does this fit in with your criticism of the Turing model. It seems to be one of the things that is left out. Um, so it seems to me one of the things that's left out, at, at least from most presentations of what the Turing thesis is, is um, the notion of, of feedback loop or I.O., right? So the possibility that input from the world changes the program. Um, does that 
fit into either time or energy? Or, or um, he really discussed that. Um, feed, feedback loops, I think, are a good example of uh, something that cannot be ignored when you're looking at complex systems. And I, I suspect most people here would agree that intelligence, uh, at least in the wild, is a complex system. Now, whether we can find uh, a magic bullet that's, you know, the E equals MC squared that explains intelligence that in that compact format uh, remains to be seen. I am very skeptical myself. Um, but uh, I think a key, um, a key missing point from Turing's model is the, the lack of con connecting to reality. So a computation takes time and, and of course, energy as well. Um, and you can't really uh, ignore that. And you know, the fact that we've relegated uh, work on, on uh, uh, time-dependent computation to, to uh, um, embedded systems research is very strange to me, that, that it's, it should permeate all, all uh, of computer science. Um, I find it a little bit odd when you say that the Turing machine leaves out time and energy. I mean, all the computational complexity classes are, I mean, all of them, or many of them are built on the Turing machine model. I mean, it doesn't really matter whether it's a Turing machine model or something related. Um, I mean, and the classes are admittedly cr crude, like polynomial time, log space, and so on. But, I mean, if those smart people would be able to refine their complexity class, they would have done it. So it's a difficult field, but your claim that the Turing machine model leaves out time, I think is at least overstated. And energy is, I mean, related to other resources, like maybe, you know, space you need. I mean, it's not a one-to-one -one and not perfect, but I mean, at least that's addressed. So how can you say that the Turing machine model ignores that? And the second point that you say it's ignored in formal AI um, time and energy, well, there's, in a sense, the opposite. I mean, the problem is hard enough if, if you ignore time and space. And if somebody had a good idea of resource bound, it's usually called resource bounded AI. I mean, people have tried that, and there are papers about that. They have lots of blah, blah. Yeah? Um, so um, it's, it's difficult. Yeah? And yes, I mean, ultimately, we want resource bounded AI. Okay, that's sort of my second part, and the first part is that Turing machine model has time and energy in it. Yeah, I mean, if if you want an easy field, you know, don't pick AGI. So, uh, if if physicists had said this, yeah, sure, it took two thousand years uh, to get to E equals M C squared, depending on how you count. But uh, you know, we'd we'd still have. Uh, uh, wind, water, earth, and fire. If um, if people have thought had thought this way, you know, oh, it's so difficult. So let's not try to solve it. I think it, it, it's more a question of, of of where to start, right? I mean, I think you guys somewhat agree on what kind of theory would be would be great to have. So it, it's a question of do you do you, do you start by solving problems with, with relaxed requirements about how much time something would take and how much energy it would use, and then hope to learn something that way that will later let you prove something about systems with more realistic use of time and energy? Or do you start with realistic constraints on time and energy from, from the beginning and get results that are limited in some other way than the limitations of the kind of results Mar Marcus has has found because no one knows how to jump right to the kind of results that 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 we want. So I, I just I just wonder. So given given that you want to focus initially on situations with realistically bounded time and and energy, then obviously the the sort of universal AI characterization of general intelligence in terms of kind of the, the average ability to get reward over all computable environments where environments are weighted by Kolmogorov information or something. This, this probably isn't how you want to think about general intelligence. So then how, how do you conceptualize general intelligence in, in a way that takes into account 
time and, and, and resource bounds. I mean, do, do you feel it's premature to try to crisp it up a formalization of what general intelligence is? I mean, what's, what's your intuition about it? I guess the point of my talk, um, uh, I would really go be going beyond the boundary of the purpose of my talk if I answered that directly. Uh, because what I'm really trying to do is, is raise people's awareness of the fact that if you simplify in certain ways, then maybe you change the problem. And so the, the question you just posed is exactly the question I, I think people need to pose, in fact. Uh, what does it mean to assume that, um, that we ignore time for a while or ignore energy or both of them for a while? How, you know, where would we, where would E equals MC squared be if Einstein had done that? Well, it wouldn't exist. And the power of E equals MC squared isn't the equation itself, it's the fact, it's the equation plus the fact that the terms tie it to reality of some sort, to something that can be measured. Um, so, um, when you simply, so, it, you know, intelligence doesn't, it wouldn't exist um, if it wasn't for the limited time and energy in the world. Because you don't need intelligence if you can just, if you have all the time in the world. So, um, so uh, to me, that's, that's a sign that maybe uh, it's, it's not the right simplification. Uh, granted, you, we don't jump to the right solution immediately, including all constraints. So we need to remove some constraints to make the problem simpler, and that's been the progress of science for millennia. Uh, but it, do, it matters how you remove the constraints and which ones. Right. So what's your suggestion? Don't remove time and energy. What, what you uh, that's another talk. Look at, I'm a co-author on at least uh, two, if not three papers that address that to some extent. Look out for the big paper on that one uh, I, I, in I'm next year. I don't know the answer of what your line of thinking is. I, I was just hoping you'd enlighten everyone else, but I guess we can wait a little later. Yeah, I won't have, won't have the space. It'll sound uh, incomplete if I try it.